So, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure. Uh, so, all the way from Taiwan, no, really, from New York City uh, to Taiwan, uh, the dean of our college at the New School in New York City, Stephanie Browner, who uh, also has uh, put uh, much support behind this event. So, this event is co sponsored uh, by the New School and particularly by Eugenian College, uh, thanks to uh, Stephanie. So, can we give her a round of applause for that? Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Just a few words and then I'll introduce Trevor back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's exciting to be here. I've watched the growth of platform cooperativism over many years as Trevor has developed that in collaboration, always through conferences that gather people from around the globe. It is one of the most sort of inspiring elements of this effort is that it's truly, as Anthony was saying, democratic and it is deeply committed to justice and equity and fairness. Those are, in fact, principles of our university. We are not a utopia. We don't always quite act on those, but those are our goals, and I also understand those are some of the goals of the institution here. So it's really a pleasure to be co-sponsoring this work, this conference that is committed to thinking about the economy and the sharing economy and co-ops in a digital age. Um, it is really my pleasure, and I bring also greetings from the president of the New School and the provost. Uh, we have been supportive and in admiration of Trevor's work for many years now. These conferences have also happened in New York City on alternate years. And so I've seen different angles on it, different questions grappled with. Uh, and I think this movement, and it is a movement, is only growing and taking deep roots uh, through the contribution of people who are welcomed into the community, into these conferences. Uh, so this is both scholarly, but also deeply grassroots, and I think that is where its power lies. So a few words about Trevor. I've known him a long time, seven, eight years now. He's a scholar activist. He's a professor of culture and media at the New School. His book, Uber Worked and Underpaid, How Workers Are Disrupting the Digital Economy, introduces the concept of platform cooperativism as a way of joining the co-op model with the digital economy. His edited volumes include Digital Labor, The Internet as Playground, and Factory, and Ours to Hack and to Own Platform Cooperativism, A New Vision for the Future of Work and a Fairer Internet. He is the founder of Platform Cooperativism Consortium, which earlier this year received funding to support the ecosystem of platform co-ops over the next two years. Trevor frequently presents on the future of work to media scholars, lawyers, activists, computational designers, union leaders, and policymakers worldwide. He's a member of the Barcelona Advisory Council on Technological Sovereignty, and his articles appear in many, many magazines, including The Nation, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Le Monde, The Washington Post, and many others. He is much esteemed on our campus as a thinker, a leader, a convener of good thinking amongst many, and also as a great teacher. He's brought some of his students here today. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here to say welcome to all of you in this co-sponsored conference and to welcome Trevor. So first I had thought uh, that I would present and read a paper to you uh, as I often do when I'm jet lagged. Uh, but then I thought I would just throw that away and uh, do something else. Um, so uh, to maybe respond a bit more to the uh, presentations that we saw yesterday, okay? So uh, I will be speaking for 40 minutes and it'll be pretty fast because there's a lot uh, to cover. Uh, so the questions we have to do uh, later. So I will just jump in, okay? So uh, much uh, just to sort of set a bit of the stage uh, for this, over the last uh, few years we saw uh, now also substantiated through research reports, right, uh, the illegal operation of uh, many of the companies in the sharing economy, the Ubers and Lyfts and the TaskRabbits and Airbnbs. We saw now also substantiated through studies by MIT and other uh, colleges 
um, that it uh, contributes to congestions in cities. Uh, so we saw that edge populations are not considered in design, so blind people have sued uh, Uber, and so have people in wheelchairs. Uh, and we saw, of course, this all not never, right, of course, never isolated, just thinking about the digital economy, but really thinking at a larger part of a development over the last 40 years, a shift away from direct employment to independent contract work in many countries. Uh, we have seen also substantiated, and Michelle uh, in, uh, talked about this yesterday in his keynote, uh, the unsustainably low wages. If you think about uh, uh, you know, Uber, for example, so when Uber first came into New York City, they said that uh, drivers make $100,000 a year, right? Uh, which of course was a lie, and uh, now we find out that it is uh, below minimum wage. But it took a few years for MIT to catch up with its studies, right? And so to actually show with research that this was not true, and by that time, drivers had already fallen for these uh, lies. Uh, and then, of course, the aim to create global monopolies. Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, when you all get up in the morning, we are probably all checking the news on like four or five platforms, and they are owned by just a handful of people, right? As I always say, they would probably all fit into a Google bus. And so, and why is that a problem, right? This sort of concentra concentration of data uh, ownership. Uh, because as we see almost every day, certainly every week, every month, right, compromised uh, privacy, uh, just today, I think, or yesterday, a huge data breach at uh, Facebook again, right, for the how many ever time. I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg will apologize. Uh, so centralized data ownership, all of these things. So just to set the stage. Um, also, one question uh, that often comes up is, uh, and part of the slides is cut off, um, is uh, why uh, isn't this all much too small for us to even talk about, right? So we don't really know how big the gig economy is. And of course, this differs from Hong Kong or China to the United States. But even in the United States, uh, you have uh, a very large number of people, one in four, involved in that economy. So the Airbnb guest, the person who takes an Uber taxi, but actually only very few people work in it. And then even fewer people work full time. But yet, I would say that this is still something we should consider simply because, just think about when Marx was writing about the proletariat, right? This was a minute part of the population or of the workforce, too, right? So that doesn't mean it's not important and it's not the way where things are going. Uh, so you can dive into this, uh, uh, and I think Stephanie uh, already alluded to these uh, books. Um, so there is also, um, uh, actually the C-Center translated my original essay into Chinese, so that's available as well if you want to sort of dive into this. Uh, but I wanted to just start uh, in my hometown, so I live in Brooklyn, right, and for about 18 years I work in this uh, food cooperative uh, every month, two hours, 45 minutes. Uh, I'm a cashier. Um, and uh, so I also uh, live in a co-op, right? And uh, I, my children went to a, a parent cooperative in Brooklyn. And which is, there's nothing ide idealistic about it, or it's not particularly like a gloomy story, right? It was actually very problematic and difficult to uh, work in this child uh, cooperative. <coughs> to contribute to that uh, took uh, endless hours. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that they are basically cooperatives are everywhere around us, or as Melina would say, uh, they are hidden in plain sight, right? So, and uh, this is why after 10 years of working on digital labor, uh, I, in 2014, uh, basically uh, wrote this text introducing this uh, idea to bring the, the, the cooperative business model to the digital economy. Uh, so basically joining this history of the Cooperative Women's Guild and the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers with uh, today's apps-based gig economy, right? So, and uh, this is basically bringing together this like extreme strength of the co-op movement, which is often underestimated, right? Mondragon, 74,000 workers, right? Largest worker cooperative in the world. Uh, which uh, <coughs> has probably laid off three or four people since 1956, right? Um, you see the employment numbers, and we saw this yesterday in the ICA presentation already. Uh, in the United States, the number of worker cooperatives is very small, uh, around uh, between three and 400, whereas in France, you have 300,000, right? And I think so this is, I think, where the promise lies of this model is really to see, like, why, why is this such a small number? And maybe 
by carrying this to the internet, we can scale this up and make something that really means something for people in terms of social justice and alleviating poverty and inequality and scaling that up uh, as a model altogether, right? So uh, there are four pillars of uh, platform cooperativism, if you like. So it's democratic governance, right? And this is really uh, you know, also you know, demonstrated and supported by groups like Colab. And I know Danny Spitzberg is here. Danny, are you here in the audience? No, still sleeping. Uh, and, uh, and tools like Lumio, right, that makes this possible. So people say like, well, you can't really have distributed governance. People can't really work together if they are distributed. But that's wrong, right? The tools exist and the practices exist. It's not just about technology. Uh, it's also about co-design, right? So to actually include the people that are usually uh, on the outside of these design processes of these waterfall design in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, people with disabilities, uh, anyone who is outside the norm, right? Uh, so uh, transgender people, uh, people who are not usually included in design processes. And this addresses exactly the power asymmetries between programmers and users because it's co-design, right? So people design together and determine what is built together and it includes edge populations. So uh, when I talk at business schools, they always ask me, like, well, you know, but how does this compare possibly to the Silicon Valley giants? How does this possibly uh, compare to all these amazing uh, qualities that we see and the conveniences that we all appreciate? And uh, so very quickly, uh, I suggested in, in 2014, this is sort of this graphic in the middle, right, to sort of rip out the algorithmic heart of Uber and uh, put in a co cooperative values. And uh, so, but what does it actually bring in terms of uh, improvements? It's, a higher, it's higher quality jobs, it's uh, fair pay, right, broad-based ownership, and possibly allowing co-ops to scale. A lot of this we don't really know, right? Like nobody really knows what will happen because this is all very new, right? So this has really just, just been around for a few years. And how this will scale, we don't know. You can have access to member capital. The revenue flows in the community. So if you have an Airbnb in Hong Kong, the money is not carried to Silicon Valley where it is spent on, I don't know, luxury cars. Uh, but you can actually spend it in the community, right? So the profits that are made stay here and don't go to Silicon Valley. Uh, there are potential tax benefits. And then in the aftermath of 2008 uh, of the financial crisis, we saw that co-ops have much more resilience, and I'm sure Melina Morrison will tell us much more about this later on. Um, so there are typologies, of course. So we see worker platform co-ops, we see producer platform co-ops, multi-stakeholder, data cooperatives, and also protocolary co-ops. And I will give you examples of those very quickly in a minute. So this is also not uh, an academic pipe dream, right? So there are uh, 250 projects in that uh, ecosystem right now, uh, pretty much uh, worldwide, as you can see here. So uh, I think I will just uh, run you through some of the most exciting uh, uh, examples. And of course, those of you who are like family and know me for a long time and who are here, you have heard this all many times before, but the people who haven't, maybe this is for the first time. So, Definitely check out SMART, right? It's a really uh, key inter uh, uh, intervention uh, in the uh, digital economy or in the freelance economy altogether, basically creating a mutual risk cooperative to accommodate uh, freelancers mostly in the creative industries and turning them into employees of SMART for the moment of the gig and also paying them seven days after the gig is done alleviating the two key problems for freelancers. One, anxiety, right? Like, where's my next job coming from? The other one, of course, also, uh, will I ever get paid? In New York, uh, until recently, this used to be up to a year that freelancers would be paid on average after the work was done, right? So how are they supposed to pay their rent? Uh, okay, so then uh, just to keep up the pace here, uh, in Montreal there's an interesting uh, blockchain example. I have to at least use it once uh, to please David, uh, who is uh, equally like me, very skeptical of blockchain. Uh, but nevertheless, this is quite promising. So the idea of uh, basically connecting, taking out the middlemen altogether, there is no taxi business whatsoever. It connects uh, drivers uh, with uh, potential customers directly through a protocol, right, the blockchain. And, uh, and it runs the whole thing as a cooperative. It's just launching. Uh, then also we are uh, 
working on a research uh, project right now together with the RDRC uh, where we are researching, where we are proposing for the Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto uh, to run the whole thing as a data cooperative. So basically have a smart city project run as a data cooperative and what that means, we try to spell out and how this would be governed, we try to spell out and we only have until November 5th. So. Uh, so you, you, it's a project, you're probably familiar with it, right? So it's Google's uh, attempt to play out the smart city in Toronto uh, in this area there. Uh, then there are examples like Wright Austin. Uh, Cortabo is a, uh, basically a cooperative you know, taxi company. 5,000 drivers operates all over Italy with an app. Uh, you have, uh, just in the making here, a co-op cycle. I don't know if the member is here. Yes. Co-opt. Let's hear it for Co-op Cycle. Um, and uh, so an open source platform uh, for worker-owned cooperatives to have bicycle deliveries uh, for food and other uh, ways in which you can use uh, that. And it's uh, open source and usable by other projects in the community. I was just uh, on Thursday, so uh, a day before this conference started, I was in Silicon Valley and met with the leaders of the taxi and cargo cooperatives of Brazil. And uh, we were thinking uh, about uh, a global taxi platform co-op uh, organized by international trade labor unions, or why wouldn't the ILO come in or the uh, ICA come in, right, and help to support this, or this could also be facilitated by the PCC in some way. Of course, a huge project, but one that is really overdue. You would probably all agree. Uh, in New York City, uh, three small cooperatives of uh, women uh, started uh, to uh, go together, created a platform called Up and Go. And so that is actually its own cooperative, right? So there are the three cooperatives that feed it, but the platform is its own cooperative, so it's a kind of innovative co-op form. And they, uh, where TaskRabbit and other cleaning companies take uh, 30, 35, sometimes 50% of the revenue, they take five. So 95% of the revenue goes to the co-ops that uh, work for this. Platform co-ops act, so they act as labor platforms and exactly don't do what Uber and Lyft and all of these companies do, which is pretend that they are tech platforms and have nothing to do with this sort of sweaty labor that's happening there on this platform, right? So, uh, and there are examples like Fair BNB, which uh, Damiano, the, one of the founders, emailed me yesterday and said, like, finally, we are a worker co-op. So uh, this is basically trying to push back against uh, Airbnb. And uh, starting in small communities uh, in, I think, five European countries and uh, basically giving community benefit to uh, people who use, uh, who become hosts uh, for this platform. So up to 8,000 euros go into playgrounds and other local projects supported through the platform. Again, taking the money, the profit, not to Silicon Valley, but keeping it in the community, right? Uh, then Fermando and uh, Felix just walked in, right, an uh, online uh, marketplace cooperatively run, uh, uh, cooperative staffing services. And so this, I think, is important and also in response to David yesterday, really uh, goes beyond this tyranny of the measurable, right? So when companies ask you, well, you know, uh, Tyler Cohen, a writer for the New York Times, he asked me, uh, you know, like, well, what's the percentage of the GDP? You know, no, that's, that's not the right question. So what you want to ask is like, what value is created that's usually not measured, right? So where is the value that's measured that is not in, uh, that can't be pinned down in, in uh, dollars? Uh, Savvy, uh, also in New York, it tries to diversify the patient pool for people who take research studies, medical research studies. Um, you've heard of Green Taxi before, I'm sure, right? Uh, in Denver, so it's again like a taxi cooperative. Uh, Social.coop, right, trying to get this idea of Twitter into a distributed realm uh, and uh, running it as a Mastodon instance. Uh, we were approached by these students from uh, Nigeria who started a platform co op for textbooks on their campus. Um, Stuxy in, uh, in Canada made some over $11 million last year. Uh, my data in Switzerland tries to uh, cooperatize uh, patient data, so basically giving co uh, patients control over their data so that they can release them to their doctor and maybe to the hospital, but sell them to a for-profit research hospital uh, and then donate this money to public research. 
uh, Resonate, Resonate in Berlin is a Spotify, cooperatively run Spotify, uh, also run on the blockchain. So, will these projects ever scale? Right? This is the question. There's always this like, discussion about this will never scale. Right? How will this, like, uh, many people have told me, right? like, well, this is just, uh, why do we even talk about this? Uh, you know, this will never replace Facebook. But maybe this is just the wrong question, right? And uh, also, why is this, this logic of Silicon Valley to take over the world and dominate all industries? Maybe you need to do that in some sectors, like in the taxi industry or with short-term rentals. There you need to be transnational. But with the worker cooperatives for home cleaning services, you don't. Right? There you can replicate uh, and see replication as a, as a way of scaling. Right? So this, I think, is something to think about. So the new school, uh, at the new school we have um, uh, started the uh, Platform Cooperatism Consortium and now are about to launch the Institute uh, for the Digital Cooperative Economy. And uh, what we try to do is basically to create, to, to push forward applied research in this area. Right? Because it's uh, un entirely under-researched. Like I said, we don't really know what happens when these companies go online. Uh, so then I also wanted to put point to Nathan Schneider's book. Uh, everything for everyone. So he has a beautiful narrative of the sort of history and, and strengths of cooperative and how this could play out in the future, which I think is also part of this uh, discussion. So, and then another question, I think this was brought up by David yesterday as well in his wonderful and entertaining uh, evening marathon. Um, so who will ever fund these projects, right? But where will the money ever come from? Uh, well, in France, you have, uh, you have very, several uh, incubators now and accelerators that start this, right? So in France, we're just approached by a co-op venture, which is basically trying to push platform co-ops further. In the US, you have start.coop. Uh, in Australia, incubator.coop. And in the UK, there are projects. And now, uh, we are also trying to do this with this platform co-op development kit that I will talk about in a second. So, uh, unfortunately, cut off again, but the, what I wanted to bring up with this slide is basically that, uh, let's say, you know, I'm German, right? I come from Berlin originally, and there you have these uh, credit unions and people's banks that are now so large um, that they are basically indistinguishable from other banks, right? You have co-ops like REI or Ace Hardware that are enormous, right? But what do they have to do with 1844, right? What do they have to do with this sort of mission to help the poor and the weak? They're just businesses like anyone else, right? They're just economic entities and uh, hardly bringing many benefits uh, to the workers. And so the question that I would bring up is one of identity and the need of cooperatives to invest in their own future. Why are these incredibly wealthy cooperatives that make billions and billions of dollars not invest in these experiments, not sufficiently, right? This is where the money should come from. It should come from the cooperatives, from the cooperative world, it should come from credit unions, and uh, they should sort of re-examine their identity and really sort of focus again on, the topic, uh, on, on their social justice mission, right? And they need to invest in their own future. So another way is uh, co-ops. Uh, it has actually started, so Resonate uh, in Berlin. Uh, actually received a million dollars from another cooperative, Art Chain, in Seattle. Uh, they partnered. And, uh, and this photo of us yesterday uh, should just say that we are just very, very many. We are so many more than they are, right? I mean, there's, we are, there are so many of us. So there's a real strength in numbers, right? So if we work together, we can finance whatever you want. So there's also an urgency to this, right? It can't wait. It can't wait to, to write uh, you know, many more uh, white papers on this, right? When I worked in Germany, I see this. They have many white papers on the future of work and uh, very little action, if any, right? But this doesn't happen to these extractive companies every single day, right? They are out there establishing realities on the ground. So where are the cooperatives? They need that now. They need to be there right now, like tomorrow. Not, not a year from now, not half a year from now, not after 25 million white papers, right? There needs to be action now because the people who in these markets arrive early will dominate and win, and, not, and otherwise you will have hardly any chance, right? And this is so great in Hong Kong and in many other countries like Brazil, 
where just these companies haven't uh, um, established themselves so much. So there's a real opportunity right now for a short period to kick in with the cooperative economy, right? So the Platform Co-op Development Kit is this project that we are running through the, um, through the, uh, through the PCC. And uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, to answer some of these problems. So some of them are really about uh, changing people's mindsets. So to say that, you know, maybe it's time to uh, really think about, uh, you know, to work, uh, to, to examine this history of cooperatives and what it can bring uh, to the economy. But we are also building tools. Uh, so an open source labor platform that uh, doesn't exist. There's no fully open source labor platform. So we try to uh, build one. An interactive map of the co-op system, uh, platform co-op system. Uh, deliver case studies that can be used in business schools and law schools because there's absolutely nothing uh, on, this, on this whole area in this uh, but, and many other projects. So the work of, at the PCC and the IDRC, uh, we are working together. Uh, basically, we are trying to create this virtuous tornado, as we call it, uh, and uh, basically based on these principles of open source, democratic governance, inclusive design, and broad-based platform ownership, we want to go uh, and uh, work in, so with this initial funding that we have, uh, we want to start, but then we want to bring this work and these platforms to local communities in Hong Kong or other countries with local funding and continue this project in that way, right? So that's, it's sort of a tornado because the work doesn't really end, right? It's uh, just continuing with different communities in different sectors and territories. We started work at Harvard Law School in January to uh, build, uh, an, uh, to build a, a legal uh, support for these platform corps to make it easier in the US to start them. Uh, we started a pilot uh, in India, and you saw, heard from Namia yesterday. Uh, so I was there in Ahmedabad a few weeks ago, and we started to work with these 25 women here. Uh, so they will be the pilot group for the Platform Co-op uh, for Beauty Services uh, in Ahmedabad. And uh, also, so here you see them, uh, you know, being trained. Uh, they learned how to open a door and to, to greet a client and uh, have to say their name and say, I'm here to clean, uh, to, I'm here to, uh, you know, do your makeup or cut your hair. And to show this tyranny of the measurable, right, and how we don't really know what success means, also is shown in this tiny example because low caste women, like the ones that you see here, are usually not allowed to say their name or they don't say their name in everyday life. So them standing there with a the phone, as Namia mentioned yesterday, that alone, right, them holding an, 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 a smartphone and saying their name changes their life already and how they feel about themselves and how their community feels about them, right? That doesn't show up in a Silicon Valley spreadsheet, right? Uh, we work with, also with uh, 3,000 uh, childcare professionals in Illinois, uh, and there it's probably be uh, an onboarding tool and a governance tool for their uh, co-op. They were organized by the Service Workers Union. Uh, we're working in Australia with uh, this cooperative life, uh, so a social care cooperative, uh, the only worker cooperative in uh, this sector in Australia, they told me. Uh, and uh, this last summer, I started working with refugees um, in uh, Germany. So I met with these uh, women from uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Afghanistan, and uh, trying to build an elder care platform uh, with them to help them to integrate. And we, uh, this area of refugees is something that we work, uh, have put a lot of hope in and try to expand. So these are the experiments. In Brazil, uh, we are working with catadores. Uh, so these are the recyclers. Uh, the bit, uh, Brazilian government doesn't really recycle, so uh, the same like in India and in Colombia. Basically, they have these groups that collect the uh, all this uh, uh, recycling, uh, recyclables, and uh, sell them, right? And uh, so they are organized as cooperatives, and we are working with them. This is uh, all of these projects, as you can see, are enormously scalable, right? So Saver has uh, 106 cooperatives with uh, 300,000 members. Uh, the Catadores are uh, uh, millions, if you count them across these countries that we just mentioned, right? So very, very scalable projects, all of them. Um, 
Okay, so, and uh, Pung Nai said yesterday, and it's a pity that she isn't here, she said, she asked if uh, platform cooperativism is really embedded in real, uh, uh, real struggles of social movements, or if it's really a socialist uh, utopia. And so I wanted to quickly uh, respond to that. Uh, this last uh, summer in August, uh, the leader of the uh, German Democrats, the second strongest party in Germany, invited me and said that she had read my book and now she wants to do it, which I thought was, would never happen in the US. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and a few days later, she convened a large group of you know, journalists and the public and uh, made it part of her political platform. Uh, so here you see more from that event. And um, so Jeremy Corbyn, a few years ago, included platform cooperativism in his uh, digital manifesto, so his vision for the future of the internet. Uh, there's a whole group of uh, uh, a consortium, if you like, in Berlin that supports platform cooperatives. There's a very active group in London that uh, convenes almost yearly uh, now for the annually for the past few years. And uh, I recently also spoke with the uh, French labor minister at the G7 and introduced her to this idea. And uh, Alicia Gaza, the uh, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, has also been part of our event. So we really try to uh, in, in, uh, integrate this with uh, social movements. Uh, we are working on a policy level. So you may have heard about the Main Street, uh, Main Street uh, Ownership Act uh, that uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, uh, pushed through with a huge deal for cooperatives. And she wrote us two days ago and said she wants us to write uh, a policy brief for her so that she, she can, um, with her next bill, support platform co-ops uh, in the US Senate. So uh, we are working on that. This is what we wrote for her uh, two, a year ago. She had asked for this. And now we convened a, a team of like some 15 policy facilitators to uh, help her write this. Uh, this is what I proposed to the German government. Um, so basically trying to, I can't really go into all of this, but uh, this is sort of what we are working on. Uh, there is, uh, again, cut off here, unfortunately, uh, the uh, idea of bringing the uh, platform co-op movement together with the Fair Work Foundation uh, coming out of Oxford University, uh, which has basically taken some of the uh, key points on what decent digital labor would look like that I developed in 2015 and then they were taken up by the um, Domestic Worker Alliance and others and then they developed this further but uh, in, in great difference to us they actually want to certify platforms all over the world uh, based on these uh, so this would be a great thing actually to go together maybe with the PCC Hong Kong and other PCCs uh, to uh, in, in Japan and uh, elsewhere to agree and basically say that new platform co-ops will all be certified by the Fair Work Foundation and uh, thereby abide by certain labor standards. Because as we know, uh, co-ops and exploitation uh, sometimes uh, you know, are not contradictions, right? Sometimes we see co-ops also working. There have been um, events like this, uh, many of them. And just to, to end, right, I want to say that, um, so if I, uh, close my eyes, right? And I think uh, 30 years from now, and I think like, will this still be around, or like, what? How will this play out? Uh, I think that this will definitely be still part of the digital economy, uh, but it really depends on on all of you, right? Be this in Turkey or here in Hong Kong, or in Taiwan or wherever you are, right? It, it's on Finland, right? In Australia, and uh, so like. It depends on us, right? It's not something that the PCC or I or anyone else can do for you. Or, you know, the only way we can work is like with you and, uh, and also in, in based on ideas of self-reliance and autonomy, right? Which are core of the co-op uh, principles as well to, to basically push this forward. So then I wanted to already invite you as we are here. Uh, uh, and uh, next year in mid-November, again at the New School in New York City, we will have another instance of this. And uh, I hope that uh, you will join us. The idea there is to collaborate uh, with Columbia University. And so we want to go into this event together and uh, bring all the big accelerator programs, incubators, accelerators in the US together and introduce them uh, to this idea. And that is really it. And we actually do have time for some questions, which I did not anticipate.
That's right. We still have 14 minutes, so ample time for Q&A today. Yes. Any question or comment? Yes, in the middle. Yeah. Please raise your hand so that people around the world can hear you. No, uh, first, it's in the middle, and then uh, Shi Jia on the left. Hi, this is Zito from Taiwan. Um, my question is that you have seen so many cases. So how does like individual, like local contacts, different contacts from different country affect mm -hmm. how does this co-op work? Because it's a framework, but after right. this framework going to local context, mm -hmm. how do they differ or how do they yeah. get into the context? Right. Thank you. Well, we, we see, uh, I mean, co-ops are like snowflakes, right? As you know. So they are different. They have a million different shapes and forms. And uh, so uh, what we see is from country to country, really they are completely different. Right? So the interest that people in India have in labor platforms isn't shared very much in Germany, for example. It right? leaves them fairly cold because they are, they, there isn't so much poverty. Right? Um, and uh, so in Germany, you have a lot of interest in cooperative data ownership, in building uh, cooperative uh, infrastructure, you know, like a municipal broadband or uh, you know, distributed uh, governance and uh, all of that, like cooperative ISPs, internet service providers. Uh, whereas, you know, in the US, I see uh, quite a bit of passion uh, for these labor uh, applications, uh, and, but of course also for uh, cooperative infrastructure. So what this will be in Asia, based on your history and uh, your complicated history, right, with cooperatives. Right? I mean, not a very checkered history, right? If you look at what the British did with cooperatives in, in Hong Kong, um, right? Uh, so it, it's about reinventing uh, this model in a way and, and applying it to the local context. And it might look completely different here than it would uh, in other countries. Uh, and the structure of cooperatives? What do you mean? Yeah, like, like you say there are principles of co-op, and is there any conflict between like, local contacts? Have you seen any con uh, conflict between local contacts and the principle of co-op? Well, I mean, uh, one question that I was asked recently uh, uh, really struck me, which asked me about cultural colonialism, if this isn't cultural colonialism. So I think it's not, because if you think about the idea that is so at the center of this, which is co-design, right? So if you co-design, uh, this is just as much shaped by every single worker and person that is part of this co-op uh, than uh, somebody who comes in and maybe had an uh, initial idea. So I don't know if that answers this question. Yeah. Maybe some women to answer questions too, I don't know, to, to respond to questions too. Not just the dudes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ilya from Taiwan. And I'm interested in the in incubation program or incubator. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, uh, does that mean that uh, uh, co-op starting to move uh, to get in touch with the uh, much in, uh, in the cycle of building co-ops or to extending its, its uh, uh, I mean, uh, in, the incubator is the one who help form co-op, or the uh, incubator itself is co-op. Oh, okay. Well, as you can see, incubator.coop in Australia is a co-op. Uh, Start.coop is a co-op. Uh, so it depends. With, the, with this development kit, what we are trying to do is uh, basically it's it's based on on. Uh, the experience of having these uh, emails, like, I mean, really almost every day, right? And Michael McHugh here uh, from the PCC at the New School also can witness to that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't know, last week we got an email from uh, unemployed teachers in uh, Rio de Janeiro who say, like, basically there are millions of qualified teachers in, in Brazil and uh, they don't see any future for themselves and if, if this idea couldn't help them. Uh, uh, last year, we were approached by 2,000 uh, capped Uber drivers from Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, they asked us to help them. And, uh, and I always, I did, in the past, I never knew what to say because, I mean, I can't really, I can connect them to other people, but I can't really help them, right? And so this is what this kid tries to do in a way, answer questions that they may all have. 
you know, to show what this, what this idea is, what the history of cooperatives uh, is about, how to launch just a co-op, right, just a straight out co-op, to understand the different co-op classes, some types, the classes, right, so just very basic stuff about cooperatives, and then introduce them to uh, platform co-ops and uh, the different models that exist there. So, and then say maybe uh, we are also working on establishing a legal network, uh, also hopefully with the support from this Harvard network, to have legal scholars in uh, many countries, so we have already quite a few actually, uh, as go-to people. So like when these emails arrive, we can say like, well, why don't you go to this person in your city and they can tell you how to start this. It's often just about starting a co-op at all. I mean, it's not always about a platform co-op, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. Hi, hi uh, Trevor. Thanks for coming to Hong Kong. Um, I'm Larry. I'm, I'm from here. Uh, <laughs> hi, I, Larry. Um, <laughs> our experience in Hong Kong, basically, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be a, like an underground theme of co-ops in Hong Kong. We'll, we'll probably, in 30 years, won't, won't get a co-op law in place mm -hmm. to protect our members or whoever wants to start a co-op. Like South Korea, right? Yeah, or maybe India is, uh, yeah, from the experience yesterday I heard. Um, so without protection from the local right. uh, uh, law and governance, it is uh, well and good that we have a foundation that we can uh, get money from and all that. But what if this doesn't change? Um, I, I can't speculate, I can't say anything more than that. But um, how do we protect our members? Uh, by laws, or are we like, you know, the taxi co-ops is one accident away from the government shutting it down, you know, uh, in China or in, in, you know, probably in 10 years in Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. please let us know, you know, according to your experience and how they would tackle such an issue if it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah. it's a green, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't look nice, but please. Uh, right. Enlighten us. Yeah, well, I don't have this sort of, you know, I'm not a magician. Uh, I don't know, you know, I really don't know. Uh, and I think it is just for you to uh, experiment, right, with your local structure. And I think what I saw, heard from Jack and from many others is that there's an enormous energy around this idea of the commons here, right, like, I mean, around the world, but especially here, and also uh, given the history in Asia of uh, mutual aid societies, right, and uh, uh, this whole trajectory. Uh, so the question there would be like, how can this connect? And maybe, maybe uh, Hong Kong will be the one, the, the place where, you, where people can finally answer this question, how to make money off the commons, because I haven't seen anyone answer that question anywhere. But can I jump in here uh, yes, for, the, for the legislation? Oh, the, the next question will be from yeah. the, the, but very quickly, in Hong Kong, we do have one of the most backwards okay, uh, legislation against, okay, uh, uh, co-ops, okay, and uh, mm -hmm. so this is my personal view. It's not I'm not speaking for a PCC HK, but uh, we do. I do want to think is uh, necessary. We need to update Hong Kong's co-op law. So you know, yeah. uh, it's way outdated, even 10 years ago before the uh, digital economy. But uh, so I have invited. I hope he's on his way. Uh, Charles Mock, okay, uh, the uh, legislative council member. He said he will try to come to this morning. So if, that, there, if you know other legislative council members, okay, uh, we should try and uh, get this into the uh, lawmaking process. Okay, I hope if you see him here, okay, uh, attack him, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Okay, the uh, students sitting there, yeah, from oh, New okay. School, yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Laura. I am a student at the New School. Um, and my question is again exploring the relationship between social movements and co-ops. In particular, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. Um, and I'm a bit intrigued about how the co-op model can be applied to so, like social movements where um, like the goal in, entailed is like abstract. With that case in particular, it's more about how do you apply that model um, when it's not for like a specific uh, right um, or mm -hmm. rate that's being achieved, but like the value of people's lives. Mm -hmm. So how is that model um, sort of? Well, I, I think uh, there, there, can be, there can be no success without social movements. There can be no success without these collaborations with political parties, with social movements, number one. And number two, like to give you this example, so what co-ops did for African Americans in the United States was tremendous, right? So they went together in the, in the south of the United States uh, and uh, formed cooperatives to buy slaves out of slavery, right, as an example. 
So there's a deeply, uh, I can recommend you a book uh, that's uh, uh, by Jessica Neimert, who's incredible, uh, that outlines this history. And if you ever had doubt about the power of co-ops in social justice, should read that uh, book, uh, which really makes this connection right, between uh, the sort of African-American uh, struggle for liberation and cooperatives in the United States. All right, we get questions from the other side of the room now. Yeah, uh, good morning. I'm from uh, Hong Kong, and uh, we, uh, we I, I'm from a women group and also from uh, women worker cooperatives in Hong Kong. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I just follow the question. Um, I want you um, introduce many co-op. I, I want to know how um, co-op can be, it's, it's actually a social movement. Mm -hmm. But uh, this social movement, is it any um, work with the labor movement? I, oh, yeah, I want yeah. to know more the um, right. uh, relation or the work together. Right. Because right. Um, I have an experience uh, many years ago when we formed a co-op, and then we, have, uh, we got some critics from the union. And they say, um, uh, you, you, you organize the workers not to join the union, but uh, yeah. work together to run a business. Mm -hmm. they, they, they will yeah. criticize that. That will change the, um, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, build the identity of the yeah. worker to become a, 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 a boss. But I've, but yeah. not up to now, but people know that's a democratic way. But I saw, I, I wonder, even now in Hong Kong, many unions, they still, um, they form some business or they form as a form of a, uh, register as a company, right. a social enterprise, but they do not form a cooperative. Mm -hmm. So for us, we, 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 we think cooperative, co -op, in a co-op, they can form union or in a union, they should form co-op. So I want to know yeah. many so experiences. I should have probably uh, mentioned this uh, earlier and emphasized this earlier. So I think without collaboration with unions, uh, this will also have a significant trouble. Uh, and we had all these big uh, unions as part of our uh, conferences in the past, um, in the United States at least. Uh, so, uh, but you saw Namia yesterday, right? M uh, Maharajan uh, from Ahmedabad. Right? She talked about Sabre, and Sabre is a union right, uh, of 1.5 million people and a cooperative federation at the same time of 300,000 workers. Right? So uh, they really, and, and, and Namia described this really nicely, where she said, uh, well, you know, there is uh, basically the policy-facing work with uh, regulators, and then there is the economic development work. And economic development is cooperatives and the unions you need to face with the, with the politicians. They are much better. Right? They're much more extrovert. They're almost like a cultural inversion machine, right? Like if you put co-ops in the top, you get unions at the bottom. Because like one is uh, sort of uh, very introvert uh, cooperatives usually. Uh, certainly in the US after the McCarthy years where they really didn't want to be identified as uh, communist. That's why you don't really hear co-ops speaking out very much to their mission in public comes really out of the post-World War uh, years where they were afraid to be mixed up with communism. And then plus, of, of course, right, like if you go back uh, to the history of cooperatives, um, you see from the very beginning, this was always a bifurcated path where you had on the one hand, the people who wanted to put food on the table and on the other hand, you had people who wanted to you know, crash capitalism. And I think these tensions exist still today. For some, it's just an economic model, and for others, it's really about the transformation of capitalism. And that's, that tension is still there, even today. Okay, okay one last question? Yes, then? yes, that, la that would be our last question. Uh, I'm Kim from Korea. Uh, very nice to meet you Very nice to meet uh, in you. person. And I'd like to ask uh, <clears throat> uh, if a plat platform cooperative is uh, some kind of workers' cooperative mm -hmm. or the umbrella term that uh, can apply to uh, all kinds of cooperative. And actually, I work for uh, Agricultural Cooperative Federation. Yeah, 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 sure. And so I'm just wondering uh, what kind of implications uh, the platform cooperative can give to the conventional co-ops? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, one of the things that quite tangibly we will build is a governance tool. Right, so this is what we are working on right now. And I think the promise there is, uh, so we are working this, we're building this for the SEVA Federation uh, that have, uh, 
for example, Adivasi women, like indigenous women in the mountains of southern Gujarat in the, in the forest that never really reach the headquarters and are completely out of touch ag agriculture. Uh, and uh, so the idea is basically to train them on these very inexpensive, as David would be delighted uh, to know, right? Also like a, a smartphone in India, $40. Um, and uh, so to buy uh, phones for the village leaders and then train them on the phones and then build a tool that allows them to be part of the governance of the co-op and talk about you know, if the women are healthy, how they are trained, how their crop is doing, etc. So a governance tool. Right? Also for education, also for people who are illiterate, so uh, audio and flip phones, to, uh, built for flip phones in part as well. So there's some application. All right, okay. so, so our time is up, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for yeah. great questions, and thank you, Trevor, very yeah. much. Yeah. And I just wanted to... Um, I just want to say that most of the bulk of the work on this conference, of course, were uh, you know, up to Jack and uh, Terence, who were uh, working here on the ground, and all their support teams here. So uh, while I was sort of flying in uh, and leading this a bit from the far No, the, no, far uh, Trevor actually did more than that. And yeah, uh, one yeah, more thing is he, he selected his own background music, <laughs> which actually continues our discussion theme. And this music is called Talking About Revolution. This is our background music when we have the coffee break. He selected himself, not me. Okay. <laughs>